Okay, good morning. So um, I should say, I have great news. <laughs> I'm going to be doing sensory integration first. <laughs> so, and I hope, I, hope, <laughs> I hope you can manage this transition. <laughs> so I, I have a, a big topic today, but um, it's one that's really uh, of great interest to me because um, it's helped me put a lot of the symptoms associated with the disorder sort of into perspective. And it really starts with the origins of the sensory motor problems, which I believe stem from sensory deprivation in infancy. Um, and there are varieties of, of reasons for this. I think there's decreased opportunity and decreased experience. There's also sensory processing difficulties that are associated with Prader-Willi syndrome. And that leads to sensory integration difficulties. And all of this uh, is all related to sense, stress sensitivity. So um, why is sensory integration helpful? So those are the things that I'll be touching upon. So the question is, how do we learn? Um, we learn in infancy from imitation, from in experience, and also from reinforcement. It's a process through which environmental interaction changes brain development and function. And it really is an integrated uh, group of effects that start with our genes, but really involve how our environment, how we interact with our environment, and of course that's really how we experience both ourselves in interaction with our environment. So hypotonia is one of the classic symptoms associated with Prader-Willi syndrome. It's one of the things that helps to diagnose infants now in uh, in fact, we can make that determination from uh, histories about the pregnancy. Um, but it's one of those factors that leads doctors now to test actually for Prader-Willi syndrome. And this is an example of the extreme hypotonia, rag doll, associated with PWS. So we know now that it is a, uh, a phenotype that can be identified in, uro in utero. Um, and there is decreased movement, and this results in breech birth in a number of cases. And that in the neonatal period, our infants are floppy, they have a poor suck, and they have feeding difficulties, uh, which we touched on yesterday. In infancy, there's low arousal. Um, and many parents will say, many experienced parents who have had other children and then have their child with Prader-Willi syndrome, they will say that they worked really, really, really hard, and they finally got their child to really engage with them uh, in the infancy period, because it is really hard to get that level of arousal up. Um, there are eye gaze problems that, um, that relate to uh, problems with bonding uh, that Dr. Stiefel is going to talk about. There's low expression of affect. Their facial muscle muscles are not well coordinated with uh, emotional expression. Uh, they have delayed milestones across the board, and there's this pervasive fatigue, which really is a factor that is noted throughout the lifespan. Crawling is a really important experience for our guys. Because developmental milestones come late, I think every parent is really excited when our child has that capacity to be able to stand and take the first steps. We now think that crawling is probably the most important thing that infants can do um, because it helps build spatial awareness in the brain. And it also helps because your body contact is with the ground and you get all of that sensory experience of propelling yourself through space, through that media. It really provides a multi-sensory experience. The other thing that is so important is that if you can propel yourself from one point in space to another, then you have the capacity to look where you have been. And that perspective taking really, really is important at, as the rudiments for ultimately being able to sort of see where you are in space versus someone else. So it's one of those components that's really important for interpersonal skills later on. There are motor problems that we see throughout childhood. Um, there was some discussion yesterday about the gut dysmotility issues. Um, one of the studies that wasn't shown was one that was done by Dr. Ann Scheinman uh, in the U.S. Uh, she did a cohort of gastric emptying studies in children and found that across the board they all had delayed gastric emptying, 
We now know that that gut, gut motility problem is not just in the stomach, but it's all through the gut, um, and it really has something to do with the constipation that our individuals can have, again, through the lifespan. But most importantly, the gut dysmotility issues seem to predispose to that condition called gastroparesis, where things don't empty from the stomach, and then you get gastric dilatation, which is a risk um, for severe medical problems. And this across, again, it, it's across the lifespan. It's not just in adults who have a binging episode. It can be in children, too. Um, and we have, a, we have a, a study that is looked at um, interviewing parents, um, and we see that if you have that tendency to have gastroparesis and your abdomen swells, then you are likely to have this in an ongoing fashion. Parents have become really, really good at managing this themselves. Yeah, because like everything else with Prader-Willi syndrome, the news really hasn't gotten out there to the professional community what this is and how important it is to be addressed. Um, speech problems, difficulties with activities of daily living, um, the fine motor problems that our guys have that are notable um, in, in school. So putting a pencil in hand and having the capacity to be able to write um, really can be a challenge for them. I am going to be talking a little bit about skin picking. Um, stereotypic behaviors are those things that our kids do. A lot of them have the hand wringing behaviors, or they, they have bring their, their hands to their face, or they have the unique little ones that are special to them. Um, and they're sort of their happy stims. Um, and I think that they have a reason uh, to sort of key up their brain and help their brain focus. It also can help soothe them. Um, coordination problems are, are ever present. Um, our guys really do have difficulties understanding where their body is in space. Um, a lot of individuals have difficulties managing steps because it requires depth perception, um, and it's really difficult for them to, to make that. And there's a fear factor. They feel very uncomfortable. Uh, and then there's that pervasive resistance to exercise, um, which is nicely overcome with a little bit of competition. Um, and then the postural problems uh, that lead to the scoliosis. Um, and I think the lecture yesterday looking at spinal muscle atrophy uh, as a predispos predisposing uh, factor to um, scoliosis was most interesting. And I hope that more research will be done in this area so that we can figure out why that occurs. There are sensory problems also, and you're probably familiar with some of them. Um, it's those things that our guys feel that things just aren't quite right and that they have to do it over and over and over, like the asking or like the ordering of things in their environment. Um, they certainly have selective attention. They're very focused on what they want to be focused on, and they have a great deal of difficulty making that shift to focusing on what you want them to focus on. They have altered pain awareness. We'll talk about that. Um, they have daytime sleepiness. We heard about that yesterday. Um, that is treatable, and I think one of the most important things that we can do through the day to help our guys with their sleepiness is to get them up and moving around um, because it's, it's sort of an, it's, uh, it's incompatible with sleep. Um, that shallow breathing, the low respiratory effort, that's part of the hypotonia. Um, it's really hard to get our guys to breathe deeply. Um, and I'm always interested in having feedback from parents for what they've, they, would, they have found works. Um, uh, some people have suggested maybe having them blow through a large gauge straw and, and push a cotton ball across the table with their, with their uh, burst of um, air. And you can do that as a game, sort of like a, um, a cotton ball rugby. Um, and, uh, and of course, they like that competition, so that's a way to get them to do deep breathing. Um, but if you ask them, and I've tried actually having them blow in a ball, uh, blow up a balloon, um, but if you ask them to take a deep breath, they're, they're very good at watching you, and so their shoulders go up, but they're not exchanging any air. Um, someone from Latham Centers made the suggestion that we should teach them how to play bagpipes. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> We could have a bad bagpipe band. That would be something. Um, that low arousal, as I said, that persists across the lifespan. And um, bed pet bedwetting problems are there. And I think uh, we have an expert here who has done study on children looking at the urinary bladder. And um, the, the, just as the gut is affected by that hypotonia, um, so is the urinary bladder. And I think our guys tend to get distended bladders more easily. The message 
that tells the, from the brain, that tells the bladder to empty, doesn't get there um, in the same way that it does for all of us. So when that message goes, we might have a brisk uh, bladder contraction because it is a muscle, and then we empty our bladder. In Prader-Willi syndrome, it's something like this. I see this all the time in my adults, especially the boys. The boys don't necessarily stand to urinate, and so when they're sitting, they don't necessarily get the benefit of gravity, and so they s try to start their stream, and it's really slow to come, and so they think, well, I must not have to go, because keep in mind, they're not getting those visceral signals um, the way we do. And so then they go to bed, and then they have a, a massive urinary event uh, through the night, which, is, which causes the bedwetting. So keep that in mind. I think our guys really need to try to we need to figure out a way to help them empty their bladder. And there are some interesting behavioral tools that we can use to help them do that. Sensory motor problems persist through adulthood. And I think what makes it even more complicated for the adults is that um, they really don't have as many opportunities for sensory stimulation. Um, I think nowadays with so many children in, on growth hormone, they're able to be more competitive in sports. Um, so they can play soccer with their peers. Um, they can ride a bike, which is just amazing. Um, and they can do other things to really sort of um, provide some sensory stimulation. Um, but in adults, that really sort of minimizes. Um, I, I have joked um, that every child born with Prader-Willi syndrome should get a pass to amusement parks that is a lifetime pass, um, that they can go anytime, uh, because they really benefit from that sensory integration in the brain, uh, that opportunity for that in those rides with roller coasters and spinning rides, because they don't get the visceral feedback like we do that says, oh, I've got an upset tummy. So that doesn't happen. So they love getting spun around. Um, and, and, and it's something that adults can do. Balance difficulties persist. Clearly, those individuals who are um, obese have more difficulty. Imagine trying to move your body through space when you can't even see your toes. Um, it's, a, it's a real big issue. The stereotypies and skin picking persist. We don't really have a good idea about why people pick and why don't, others don't. Um, we do know that it tends to come and go throughout the lifespan, uh, but if you have it, odds are you're going to continue to have it as you age. Um, there are some other interesting kinds of picking behaviors that we believe are really related to stress and also opportunity, and we'll talk about that. Um, our guys have low shame and modesty, which is one of the reasons why I think some of their uh, behaviors persist, because it's one of those mechanisms that we all use to alter our behavior, but that's not easily uh, available to them. And of course, the kyphosis and the leg edema, I think, is really part of the hypotonia uh, in our individuals. It is a really uh, significant morbidity associated with obesity in adults, um, and it sets those individuals up for um, uh, the right heart failure that was addressed yesterday, and also for cellulitis and infections that occur, uh, because picking and cellulitis tend to go hand in hand. So what, how do these sensory motor problems, and how do they occur over the developmental span um, of years? So I think it really goes back to the hypotonia, because the hypotonia causes a lack of sensory experience, um, and that creates a relative sensory deprivation to the brain in PWS, and that results in a condition that I call a different kind of hunger. It's a sensory hunger. It's like that void that never gets filled throughout the lifespan. Um, so my question is, why does that happen? And I do, I'm going to do a few genetic slides here, um, because I think they are important to understanding both the hypotonia and also the sensory uh, experience difficulties that our individuals have. So there were some uh, lectures yesterday that talked about the MAGE genes, of which uh, Nectin and Macarin and, um, and MAGEL are uh, some. Um, they are uh, imprinted. Um, and this is what they do. Nectin promotes bio, myoblast survival and differentiation. So what that means is that, remember, um, someone mentioned that with growth hormone, um, those muscle bundles get bigger, but really they're still small and they stay small. That is a nectin effect. So when you don't have nectin, and that's what happens in PWS, um, you don't get that myoblast survival, and the myoblasts are the muscle progenitor uh, cells. 
And so if, you, if they don't, they're sort of programmed. And if they don't have the effect of nectin, then they just die off. And so what happens is that you see a typical mun bundle of muscles. Um, and then you look at what happens in PWS below. So the muscle fibers are actually normal. Because you, as you know, many of our children will get muscle biopsies. Um, but they are decreased in number, so strength and stamina are decreased. So they can increase that stamina and strength with motor activity, um, but they will still always be less than what uh, a typical person would have. So you don't replace those once they are lost. So there is another aspect uh, that um, uh, PWS genetically programs for, and that's impaired sensory processing in PWS. There have been some really interesting studies um, that have been done in mice, and I realize there's a big gap going, jumping from mouse to man. Um, but nectin, I'm so uh, interested in nectin because it's one of the genes that really does have a direct effect on the central nervous system. It actually promotes neuronal growth and what we call dendritic arborization. So, at, and I'll, I'll show you a nice picture that sort of um, displays that. Nectin also promotes GABA, that whoa, wait a minute neurotransmitter, and nectin prevents cell death and sensory neurons in the dorsal root ganglia. And I'll, I'll show what this means. But this is very important uh, with respect to uh, motor, uh, temperature, and pain sensation. So this is a beautiful bushy tree um, that happens to be from uh, Buenos Aires. And so if you have nectin, you know, you have that potential for having this very nice arborization that occurs in the brain, which means there's lots of communication uh, between the neurons, and that's a good thing. Uh, but in PWS, um, we think that the neurons, the axons, those uh, extensions really don't grow as long as they are supposed to, and the number of, of branches are less. And so there's greater difficulty for the message which is transmitted through these uh, pathways to get from where it needs to be. Um, and so this is an example, both looking at skin, going to this dorsal root of the spinal cord, um, where you see these nerve, how these nerve fibers um, exit the skin um, and they go to the spinal cord where they synapse there and then make the long transition up to the brain. And this is where uh, difficulties are noted in PWS. So when you think of sensory input, it's tactile um, by touch. It's proprioceptive. It's where your, your limb is in space. Some of our guys really don't have a good sense of where their limbs are in space. I, I, w I learned about this because we had an individual who was limping. And so we knew that he was having a problem with one of his legs. Um, but when we asked him which leg it was that was hurting him or he was bothered by, he actually pointed to the other leg. So we take for granted that our guys are able to identify where, where, they're, where, you know, where we touch and what stimulation they're getting from their limbs, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, so what we see is that sensory input um, goes from tactile, proprioceptive, and also kinesthetic. That's just the stimulation that we get when we move our limb in space. Um, it goes to that dorsal root in the spinal cord. And that's where we know that in individuals with PWS, there's 50% less um, of pain and temperature sensation. Um, so this is where that nectin expresses, the lack of nectin expresses its effect in the spinal cord. So our guys have diminished pain and temperature sense, and this never goes away. We do think that vibration is normal, sense of touch is normal, and position in space is okay, although I, I told you a story of how that doesn't necessarily um, happen. But, and, and we're really not sure about pressure because, you know, that kind of pressure that we do uh, for sensory um, we're, we're really not quite sure. But what we do know is that those uh, that stimuli go up the spinal cord and are greeted by a sensory gate. And of interest, that sensory gate is actually modulated by GABA, that whoa, wait a minute neurotransmitter. And so if our guys are deficient in GABA, that sensory processor is decreased. So there are two reasons. There's a hardwired reason, and there's also a biochemical reason why that sensory input doesn't get to the brain. And then what we also know is that there's uh, input to the brain through vestibular, um, and then also that input gets partitioned to various parts of the brain. So I like to think about sensory processing as related to a computer. 
Um, and so think of your brain as a computer for a moment. It has multiple inputs from eyes and from ears uh, and from other sensory organs. And then all that information is processed. Now what happens in PWS is that the signals, uh, we think, don't get to where they're supposed to go in a timely fashion. I have made uh, comments to people in my office. I've given them a demand or asked them a question. And then I can literally count 1,001, 1,002, 1,003 before they respond. M many times, uh, other parents, teachers, other professionals will say that those individuals are non-compliant. But if you give them the time to help them wait, um, they will be able to process that, that request. But if you intervene and provide another request before they've actually perceived that one, it just overloads their sensory system. Um, and then they get really frustrated. And so that's what we see. Sometimes we end up seeing the, the behavioral um, uh, manifestation of frustration uh, because th they really can't provide what, what we're expecting them to, to do. So now we can look at, at some electrical studies that have been done. These are cartoons, so they're not actual um, uh, electrical studies, uh, but they come from studies that have been done. So it's, it's a, a sort of automatic in the brain that if you ping it with a certain sensory stimulus, it, it tends to make a number of different uh, uh, relay stations uh, in the brain. And we know that each of those relay stations uh, puts forth a specific electrical burst. So we can trace that in the brain. In, and we can trace it in the brain in PWS. And so what we see is that it takes longer for the stimulus to get to where it needs to be. And also, it's not a crisp peak. You know, it's broader. Sorry. Um, and so there's a delay um, that there's more noise uh, in the signal and also the overall amplitude is decreased. So there are electrophysiological reasons why our guys don't get the signal that they need to. So there are neural transition, transmission and processing problems um, that are related to an inadequate strength to register, too much background noise, or oh, this overflow phenomena, which I think is one of those things that may play a role in, in keeping a, a behavior going once it starts. And of course, the other thing is that there's deficient feedback so that the parts of the brain that need to don't get the signal that it's actually been received. And when that happens, so the transmission persists. And so I wonder if some of those perseverative behaviors or repetitive behaviors that they have might have uh, some uh, association with these deficits. So sensory integration is important because we can increase the strength of the stimulus. Remember I told you about how moms had to work really, really hard to get their children to have that arousal uh, and acknowledgement of, of mom's presence? The same thing can happen with sensory. If we provide more of it, there's a greater possibility that it will get uh, to the place in the brain where we need to. And we also know since those vestibular things don't necessarily um, uh, have the same pathway, they go more directly to the brain, that we could provide more vestibular stimulation to help with that sensory deficit. And of course, if more information gets to the brain, then there's a greater likelihood that more of it's gonna get to the direction that we, to the, to the destinations that we want. So then if we look at the origins of of sensory hunger in PWS. We know that it has to do with the hypotonia, but it also has to do with that impaired sensory perception. So it's like what the geneticists call a two-hit model. So what is sensory hunger? I found this in the occupational therapy literature, um, and I think that it is so applicable to PWS in so many ways. I think that sensory hunger um, really is responsible for those stereotypies that our kids have, those habit behaviors that they do. I think it's responsible for that excessive and repetitive behavior and that preoccupation with lotions, water, uh, toiletries, paper, pamphlets, pens, all those things that our guys love to collect and they love to interact with. I think it has to do with some of those socially inappropriate behaviors um, that our guys do. Um, the skin picking, that's a sensory stimulation. Also, some nose picking or stuffing things in their ears or other body orifices. And then some of those less desirable things um, that are probably not appropriate to talk about after breakfast. Um, but, but that 
that people don't necessarily talk about, you know, because it's not something that's socially appropriate, but this happens a lot in PWS. So sensory motor integration can decrease all of these behaviors. And what we know about PWS is because of that reward drive, there are ways that we can set this up so that they can benefit from more of this. So I want to describe uh, a, um, uh, a little uh, cartoon here um, that looks at um, what occurs in, in PWS with response to um, expectations. So we know that if an event occurs as planned um, or if there is a demand um, and, uh, and then there is uh, a tantrum at times. So it, in, in a broad sense, there's an event and then there's a response to that event, and sometimes that can lead uh, to uh, a tantrum. So we think that, that those behaviors occur in PWS because the individual can't perceive, process, or understand what is expected. Um, that they really can't communicate back to us that they didn't understand or didn't get it, and they can't produce a motor response in the time frame expected. So all of us, we really have fast processors, you know, but they're running on a, a, a Microsoft system that was, you know, 10 years ago um, in many ways. And so they really can't have those relays go as fast as ours do. And if you think about producing a motor response in, in response to a demand, there's, that has to go through a number of, of relay stations in the brain. And so it just doesn't get to where it needs to go. And I think all of this, um, pr produces some inability to cope with the situation for the person, and they get dissatisfied with the outcome. So I look at behavior in PWS as really a symptom, and that symptom is arousal problems, perceptual difficulties, processing deficits, that mo multimodal inefficiency. Our guys are always better if you present information in one sensory system at a time. And also that disorganized motor outflow, because again, the signal has to go from the thinking part of the brain to the motor part of the brain. And then you have to coordinate a number of different muscle groups. That seems like something we take for granted. In PWS, that's very complex. So sensory motor integration helps all of these. It improves alertness. It increases attention. It decreases anxiety. It improves perception. It increases multi-sensory integration, it organizes motor outflow, it decreases sensory hunger, and it diminishes stereotypic behavior and uh, skin picking. So this is what happens when we do sensory integration. Remember the previous cartoon. So what happens is that the person's threshold is different. So we apply, remember the mom who had to work really hard to get their child to sort of attend to them? We're going to do the same thing, but we're going to be using sensory integration to boost their threshold um, so that they're able to take in more information in a timely fashion. It's sort of like priming the pump. And so this is the effect of planned sensory integration. You do a sensory prep, and then there's no behavior. And we've seen this repeatedly in school situations. So kids might have difficulty managing that transition from the, the bus, let's say, or the car into the, into the school setting where there's a requirement for them to sit. And so if you change it up and give them a sensory experience so that they're jumping on a mini tramp or they're, um, they're, they're um, crawling on a mat, doing a commando crawl on a mat, and then you put them in the classroom, they're sitting more at attention, they're alert and they're ready. It's like their brain has been primed to receive information. So for all of these interventions, an occupational therapist is really helpful because they're the people that really work with these type of problems. Um, most of the time, occupational therapists are available through early intervention services and also they're available through your IEP at school. It is more difficult to get OT services in adults. Um, but what they do is they assess the problem, they do uh, an assessment of sensory likes and dislikes, and they apply another kind of diet, a sensory diet. And it's usually individualized for each person, 
It's planned and it's time limited activities that are administered through the day. And like I said, you can actually look at the day and see where there are problems and then you can uh, apply that sensory integration activity um, prior to these difficulties because it really does enhance attention, concentration, and it improves body posture. Um, and you can also do this both in individual and group activities, which is really great for our guys because it gives them uh, an opportunity for social interaction. Plus, the other benefit of, of the social interaction or doing things in a group is that they're able to see how other people move their bodies through space. And that is also another way of learning. So there are a number of different kinds of sensory stimulations that we can use in PWS. There are proprioceptive, that's knowing where your body is in space, and also kinesthetic, that's how your body moves through space. So there are sedentary activities that we talked yesterday about gum chewing. I cannot uh, underemphasize, uh, or I can't overemphasize. Anyway, it's a really good thing. Um, and, and if you have a child who won't swallow the gum, um, that's because uh, I don't want them swallowing gum, especially with those gastroparesis problems. Um, but you can shape it. If you have somebody who swallows gum, just have them give, the, give you the gum, chewed gum back, and tell them when you give me the gum back, I'll give you a new piece. Um, and what's amazing is they love hot, spicy flavors. Um, and so, you know, use cinnamon, use sour apple. Um, they're not going to be great at blowing bubbles, okay, because that requires a lot of motor activity, but they will get an immense amount of enjoyment, uh, and that will really improve their sensory alertness. Um, we've also used um, uh, sensory sprays. Um, these are um, usually in, in tubes um, with a little bit of a mister, and they are all also very, very highly spicy uh, fruit flavors. And you spray them, and it's like, oh my goodness, you know, all of us would have that kind of a response, and it really works well in our guys. So when you find that they're sort of, you know, eye closure and they look like they're tired and their body posture gets a little stooped, you can do that, and you'll see a burst of increased alertness. And they're like zero calories. Um, uh, water play. For individuals who do um, uh, skin picking, trying to come up with a, an appropriate sensory activity that will compete with skin picking, that's like popping bu bubble pack. Using squeeze balls. Thank you very much for who put the squeeze ball in the uh, packet. Um, that's a wonderful. Um, it's, just, it's just right. Um, skeins of yarn, you saw one of the adults uh, in the pictures. Um, she would take uh, balls of yarn and she would then put them into the skeins. Um, at uh, Latham Centers, they use something called GIMP. Uh, there's something about that rope, like knot tying, things like that, that our guys really enjoy. Um, and then, of course, brushing. Brushing is always best if it's done by somebody else. It never seems to be as powerful for our guys if, the, if they do it. Um, so it, it's oftentimes everybody wants for people to do their own kind of intervention, and that never works successfully in PWS. It's always better if you do it with the person or if you do it for the person. Um, vibration, we have some very lovely individual case designs looking at the effect of vibration on the feet as a competing stimulus to decrease rectal picking. And if you, if you have some uh, knowledge of neurology, you'll know that the sensory fibers in the heel actually are the same. It's the same nerve that's in the anal area. Um, and so there's even some neurological reason why this works. Um, deep pressure, massage, uh, weighted vests, weighted blankets, the therapy balls, these really help with improving postural tone. And as if when you improve postural tone, you also improve breathing. And of course, light massage and tickling is great. I have a young lady who has difficulty all the time making the transition from the van to the house at the end of her work day. And um, it's inevitable that she will have some type of a tantrum. And if the staff just walk over to her and sort of put some deep pressure on her shoulders or sort of do a tickle into her scalp, she just melts and there's no behavior. It is the most amazing thing. 
Um, you can also use these uh, strategies to help during transitions where you know there will be difficulties. So if you have individuals who might have difficulty managing the transition to sort of bathing activities, um, you can do a deep pressure exercise first. Um, or some people who have difficulty tolerating shaving, you can do some vibration on the face uh, or curling their hair. You can do it on the scalp. Uh, or difficulty with tooth brushing, you can apply these stimuli to that um, end organ uh, to sort of prime it for what has to occur later. Um, you know, it's another thing, since our guys don't have that sense of temperature, it's not unusual for them to not make the transition in seasons. Um, and so um, I think trying to prepare them for the seasons is a sensory activity that is um, very helpful. Um, and also to work with them to, to make proper clothing selections. Um, you know, high fives, any kind of praise um, that really um, sort of gives a lot of sensory feedback is really helpful. And clapping is a great activity. Um, because when pr a person is engaging in an inappropriate behavior, what you want to prescribe is a behavior that is incompatible with that. And so if somebody's using their hands for inappropriate behaviors, never say stop picking because that'll only make them pick more. You know, don't put that idea in their head because um, it'll stay there. What you need to do is say fold your hands or let's clap to the music. It works very effectively. Um, so as, as I mentioned, there are these um, sedentary activities um, and these stimulation, um, and then some of the other vestibular activities, rocking chairs, bicycle riding, um, swinging. Swinging is a wonderful experience for our guys. It does propel them through space and it gives them that vestibular input. Horseback riding is also in that, in that vein. Um, it really helps, it helps posture. It helps promote truncal stability, uh, which is always difficult in our guys. And then uh, for those who have growth hormone, there's no reason why they can't participate in jumping exercises, soccer, competitive exercises. Um, and the other thing that I want to mention is any activity through the developmental uh, life cycle that will encourage our guys to put their hands over their head um, is really helpful. Um, I have noticed that with time, because many of our individuals have sort of a, a who haven't had growth hormone, um, have a very sort of um, uh, constricted uh, focus of attention and activity. So they sort of focus their attention on their hands that are ringing in front of them. And what ends up happening is that they get this uh, posture where their neck is down um, and they get a lot of weakness around their uh, shoulder girdle. And so any activity that you can do, even taking um, uh, very light weights and having them just raise them above their head, or if you're lucky enough to have a group activity, um, if you have a big medicine ball, lightweight, something like a cage ball, um, that they can be propelling in air above their head, or any activity like badminton or volleyball, where they can actually get their hands over their head, it's really important to stimulate strength um, and, and uh, feedback around the shoulder girdle. So there are also um, olfactory interventions that you can do for people. So we know that for increasing alertness, some of those uh, fruity um, flavors um, that we talked about for taste also work for smell. And our guys do have a good sense of smell. Um, and then there's some others that are sort of more calming um, that you can use. Um, auditory stimulation is also uh, important. Um, and sometimes our guys get really flooded with auditory stimuli. I've seen infants, um, and I think it probably has to do with um, the hypotonia in the ears and, and the fact that the sound doesn't, they don't habituate to sound the way we do. Um, and so the sound can be very noxious, and I've seen infants sort of have a, a negative response to that. Um, so sometimes whispering. So if you're trying to get them to attend to you, if you just lower your voice, you might get a greater attention. Um, wearing headphones can be very helpful, uh, not just for listening to music, um, but also to um, help screen out some noise um, that is unpleasant for them. And you can use one earplug at a time, you don't have to use both. Um, and apparently music that has a specific beat of 60 beats per minute or less seems to be very helpful. 
Um, and so you know our guys love music, and they love dancing, and they love rhythm. And uh, we haven't mentioned it, but drumming, I think, is a really, really good sensory exercise um, because they do have a good sense of, um, of um, uh, rhythm. Uh, visual. Um, there are some uh, visual tracking issues that our guys can ha that have, and so increasing visual stimulation and also decreasing stimulation uh, can be helpful for them. Um, the, the deep breathing exercises we talked about, but our guys tend to really love water, um, and you can um, do um, your hands in water as a way of helping with alertness as well. Okay, so I do want to spend the last couple of minutes talking about skin picking uh, because it is such a, a health problem. Um, I look at skin picking as really having two different kinds of paradigms. Um, I look at one that's really sort of attention and reward based. Um, I think that it stems from sensory deprivation and sensory hunger. It is part of that searching that our guys have um, that's related to reward. Um, and it definitely is, is reinforced. It's reinforcing in, it, in and of itself because it does provide sensory stimulation. And I think it tends to, to be um, something that is an automatic kind of behavior. The typography is opportunistic. It's wherever the hands can reach. So you'll see a lot of people who have lesions on their face, around their fingers, on their hands, and on their legs. Um, and uh, we usually consider most of skin picking in PWS to be mild. Um, un it's unfortunate that it does scar, but it's, it's not severe. But there is that other end of the spectrum where it is more severe. And we think that this is motivated more by stress sensitivity, um, and it tends to have more of a self-soothing uh, effect. Um, it can cause repeated uh, self-injury, um, and it can be quite severe. And this type of uh, uh, intervention, this type of, I'm sorry, the reinforcement that occurs here, instead of keeping the person in the social situation, it actually uh, removes them. Um, and then they have less stimulation, and it's a really bad cycle to get into. It's always better. Um, social reinforcement is one of those things that always decreases skin picking. So again, this excessive and repetitive behavior picking, um, it, there's no real lack of, in, there's no real inhibitory feedback. So there's no pain, no di diminished disgust, uh, decreased satiation, uh, extinction doesn't happen in our guys. They'll do the same thing forever. And of course, there are no neurochemical stops. Um, there are a lot of uh, uh, ideas that we have about the neurochemical reinforcement that occurs at the level of the brain. But the important thing for picking, the best thing is to prevent it from happening. And I think a, a good sensory diet helps to overcome sensory hunger, and I think it's one of those things that will help decrease skin picking. Uh, when a person does have picking, you always want to distract them, and you want to provide differential reinforcement of other behavior. Please fold your hands. Um, and that works, and, and sometimes, you know, people, they'll, they're very compliant in the, for the most part, and they'll do it. Um, you want to give low attention to the picking behavior, but you don't want to call attention to it. You want to reinforce healing. That's the important thing. So you don't want to say, we're giving you a sticker for no picking. No, you want to reinforce healing. So your skin is healing nicely. Um, and you can set a, a particular goal in mind uh, for when the lesion is healed. Um, you, s like I said, keeping them in a social situation really helps to decrease picking uh, because they have other things to attend to. Um, we do a lot of non-contingent sensory stimulation, so those are those uh, all kinds of sensory things that you can do that will successfully compete with um, the skin picking. Uh, we do extinction methods, so we use Band-Aids, um, uh, which work really well. There's another extinction method that works pretty well, which is making sure that the nails are cut very short, but also using a greasy ointment that is a uh, topical um, antibiotic. Um, and so what you do is you put it on the lesion many times per day, and so the person really can't get any traction. If you can't get any traction, you know, it really does uh, promote healing. And then for really severe situations, sometimes you really do have to do what we call as contingent uh, behavior management. 
Um, and I know Dr. Einfeld talked yesterday about medications for skin picking. Um, it's really, really difficult. We've had some individuals um, who uh, we've tried all of these other things uh, and it hasn't worked. And so what we've done is we've actually uh, tried low dose topiramate. So this is low dose, maybe like 25 milligrams three times a day, low dose. Um, and sometimes medications can be helpful. Uh, we've also found uh, N acetylcysteine to be very helpful. Um, and that seems to have a very low profile of side effects. Um, so if I had a choice between using something like topiramate, which does have side effects, especially that are dose related, and we've seen it in Prader-Willi syndrome, um, I'd rather do something that has more of a homeopathic kind of uh, profile. And that's sensory motor integration for today.